Hi, I'm Matt Diana I'm with DNR Fisheries Division. I uh, work in Southwest Michigan with the Southern Lake Michigan Management Unit. I'm here today to talk about dams and dam management, how they affect people, and how they affect the environment and ecology of streams. So there's all different types of dams, and they're all created for different reasons. Uh, historically, there was a lot of mill dams built. Uh, dams often have hydroelectric purposes. They're used for creation of lakes for either recreation or for uh, uh, water treatment purposes, um, and oftentimes made to control lake levels. Um, there's over 91,000 dams in the National Inventory of Dams database that are cat cat categorized as high, imp or high hazard dams. Um, in Michigan, however, there's over 2,500 dams in, a, in existence and operation that are registered, and even more that we don't have registered in our database. So these dams are segmenting our river systems pretty severely. They have a series of different impacts. Um, we talk a lot about fish barriers, and there's fish passage day, and we have this joke about fish running into the dam not being able to pass upstream. They're expensive to operate. They, they have a lot of different issues with what we call impingement and entrainment, which is when fish get pinned on the screens or suck through the generators of hydroelectric operations. It impacts temperature and water quality, sediment transport in rivers, and they're getting old. Uh, the risk of failure in dams is increasing constantly. Average age of dams in the national inventory for dam database is 57 years old, and over 75% of the, or around 75% of those are high hazard dams, which means if they fail, there's potential for the loss of human life. So I'm gonna go through each of these topics and talk about them a little bit. Uh, big, one of the biggest and most obvious thing about dams is they affect fish. Fish live in the water, dams impact the water. And in particular, uh, they impact fish movements and migrations. And we know a lot about salmon and steelhead and trout, how they migrate upstream for, as part of their life history in order to reproduce. And when you put a dam in their way, you're blocking off reproductive habitat and therefore you're impacting potential reproduction and trout fisheries. There's also a lot of native fisheries, big, big fisheries like uh, lake sturgeon where they're, they're an imperiled fish species. And part of the reason they're imperiled is because of dams blocking part of their historic migration. So we know at least they impact fisheries through blocking off reproductive areas, uh, preventing populations from mixing, and, and that can have impacts to genetic diversity. So we do a lot of things to try to facilitate passages of fish across dams. And, and this is an example on the St. Joseph River. This is Bering Springs Dam, where we've built fish ladder. Uh, DNR operates uh, eight fish ladders in southwest Michigan, three on the St. Joseph River and five on the Grand River. Um, these allow fish to get past the dam by jumping either through a series of pools or navigating a series of weirs in order to get upstream. And it works for well swimming or good swimming fish um, and jumping fish, but not necessarily to pass all native fish. Um, if interested, we do have a camera that's streaming online of the Bering Springs Dam, so you can see fish passing, and that's hosted by paddleandpole.com. Another option is to build nature-like fish waves, which is basically a stream that can bypass a dam and allow fish to swim around, but it allows all fish to swim around, and sometimes there's some issues with that. In particular, it allows invasive species to pass as well. Uh, one of the big issues in Michigan is, in, is uh, sea lamprey. Sea lamprey are an invasive species that it's common and, and they prey really heavily on or parasitize really heavily on lake trout and other salmon species. Because of that, the Fish and Wildlife Service has done an extensive program to control them, which treats chemical treatments in river systems to try to poison lamprey to prevent them from overpopulating and being a huge predator on these fish. When you take away the lowest dam in a system, it allows lamprey to pass upstream and therefore gives them more access to reproduction area. We have to treat more area of water. So there's some trade-offs to opening up river systems rather than just uh, some of the benefits to fit, uh, native fish passage. Another thing we have to consider is how it affects mussel populations, um, turtle populations, and amphibian populations. There's a lot of other organisms that live in these impoundments and these rivers, and they've adapted to these conditions through time. Uh, the one thing about mussel populations, they just can't move very well independently. They, they're, they're stuck in the sediment. They can move a slight a bit, but most of their movement happens through the reproductive cycle where they parasitize on fish 
and fish passage is part of the requirement for them to move upstream and downstream. So if there's no fish passage, there's no ability for mussels to expand their range. And these are one of the more imperiled uh, organisms in our rivers and streams today. Uh, on the flip side, when you draw a reservoir down or you remove a dam, you're exposing a lot of organisms in the sediment. So we oftentimes have to do relocation efforts, moving these mussels back to the water to appropriate habitat so that we don't impact their populations as part of a stream restoration. Uh, another impact of dams is that they change the temperature and the gradient of a stream system. So, and, and this is a really small dam. This, this is actually one that was put recreationally on Portage Creek in, in Kalamazoo. Uh, but you can see what my point here is the, it slows the water down, it impounds it, you get dark bottom in this water, so the slower moving water heats up more in the sun and it can take a relatively fast moving stream, slow it down and warm it up and change it to a more warm water stream which changes the fish community and other organisms that can inhabit those waters. And then finally, uh, streams and rivers are sediment transport machines. Uh, they're basically conveyor belts, moving sediments from their headwaters all the way down to their deltas. And here I've got an example of a big river system, and you've seen these before. Sediment moving out into the ocean, moving out into the water, uh, lake or whatever they, whatever they flow into, and depositing there. And just a good example of how sediment moves through rivers. Um, when you place a dam on that river, it blocks this movement of sediment, and sediment begins to accumulate upstream. And this example is Allegan City Dam, which is up in the center upper end of, the, of this photograph. And you can see upstream sediment accumulating in the impoundment and filling in. <laughs> and here's just a kind of a graphical representation of that. Um, Sediment moves through the dam, the dam impounds water, it slows it down, and when water slows down, its energy decreases and sediment begins to drop out. And basically how much sediment that a stream can carry is directly related to how much energy it has. And so when it slows down, sediment drops out, it gets blocked behind the dam, and you end up with legacy of years and years of sediment that should be moving downstream in the impoundment. So you either have to maintain that through dredging, through time, or your impoundment gets shallower and shallower. And as a result, you have sediment starved water moving downstream. This is the same dam, Allegan City Dam, and you can see downstream of the dam, there's, on the outside bends, there's a lot of erosion happening. And this is water that has no sediment in it, a large capacity to pick up sediment hitting these banks and eroding it away. So upstream you have deposition, downstream you have increased erosion through time. One of the biggest issues with dams in Michigan and throughout the country is that it's aging infrastructure. These are legacy projects. They were hydroelectric projects, they were mill projects. Most of them or many of them have been abandoned. Uh, maybe not abandoned, but the, the, they no longer hold uh, our, our uh, they're no longer providing the initial purpose of the dam. So they're decommissioned hydroelectric dams, but they're still in the water. There's still concrete there, aging concrete, breaking concrete, and they have the potential for failure. Unfortunately, maintaining dams costs quite a bit of money. And just like any construction project, roads, bridges, when, as infrastructure ages, it costs money to repair. Um, one alternative is removing the dam. Uh, another is doing a replacement, where you basically are taking out the old dam, putting in something new or something stronger to hold it through time. And a lot of times we're looking at a cost-benefit analysis to see is a dam removal or a dam repair financially worth it to the dam owner. Um, however, there's a lot of other concerns than just money. There's fisheries concerns that I've already kind of talked about. There's the historic value of dams. Um, a lot of these dams were put in place, or one of the reasons people colonized an area in the first place is though those mills that were on those dams were there and allowed for building, allowed for cutting of wood and building of structures that became cities like Kalamazoo. Um, and then there's the aesthetic value of dams. I mean, both dams create impoundments that are recreationally valuable for fisheries, for living on lakes, things like that. Um, but then there's also uh, kind of the familiarity with dams. People like flowing water, they like spilling water, they like their lakefront along their towns. And so a lot of times we're dealing with kind of nostalgia and, and an unwillingness to change, especially when people can't vision what it's gonna look like after a removal. 
Um, here's an example of kind of a, a halfway project where uh, we didn't remove a dam, but we changed it. We took the dam structure out when we built an arch, rip, arch riffle, which still keeps sediment impounded, but allows for some fish passage and some more of a natural stream-like environment. And a good example of the historic values of Pucker Street Dam and Niles. Uh, when they started unearthing the dam, they found remnants of the old dam. This dam was built in the early 1800s. It predates the state of Michigan, um, and it's one of the reasons why the area of Niles was, was colonized in the first place. So, you know, there's definitely some legacy history involved there. And so we, we work pretty hard when we're doing these removals to try to maintain that and, uh, you know, preserve the history while restoring, restoring the stream. And as I started to allude to earlier, dam failures occur and they're a big problem when they do. Um, these dams have been in place for a long time. There's legacy sediments. Uh, and when they do fail, it causes a fast release of water and a fast release of sediment. And, and a great example of that is what's been happening in Midland over the last year, basically. As the dams filled in the sp or failed in the spring, the impoundments emptied, left sediments, had caused a huge amount of erosion, bridge failure, and sediment deposition downstream. And so just to, this is a busy figure, but just to give you an idea what the cost as, uh, uh, kind of estimate, estimates of different types of strategies are, we're looking at dam repair, partial removal, and full removal of a dam. And you can see that they're all expensive. They're multi-million dollar projects. And sometimes dam removal doesn't seem to be a very viable option compared to a cheaper repair. However, we need to consider the long-term cost of maintaining that dam through time. You take a dam out, the maintenance cost goes away. You, put, you do a Band-Aid type repair on a dam, and you're gonna be fixing that dam again and again and again through time. So that's one thing that needs to be considered in the cost-benefit analysis. Another thing is there's a lot of funding sources available for dam removals because of the environmental value of taking a dam out. So, uh, DNR has a dam management grant where we provide funding for dam removals. There's a number of different federal programs and private organizations that'll provide funding for that type of work. So the cost may be higher, but the actual out-of-pocket cost for the owner or the organization that has ownership of that dam could be lower. Uh, this is just an example from Morrow Dam in Kalamazoo. It's, it's not a dam removal, but it's a drawdown. And when you draw down a dam, there's sediment release downstream. Failures cause sediment release downstream. And what that does is it deposits, se deposits sediments into the river, up in bank areas, in pools, and causes a lot of environmental damage, not to mention aesthetics damage. Uh, this is a problem for kayakers and canoers, for, for anybody trying to fish on the river, and it's a big problem for navigation on bigger rivers. And then upstream, like I mentioned, you, then you have a dewatered impoundment up above. This is Morrow Dam. Uh, you can see the power plant in the background, acres and acres of mud flats exposed. Aesthetics are ruined, uh, and not to mention this amount of sediment that's available for transport downstream. So I mentioned some of the difficulties when it comes to the aesthetics of a system. People can't really envision what a dam removal might look like in their town. And so sometimes you have to do some uh, cost benefit as well as some uh, kind of kind of discussion about what might be the end result from, from, from a waterfront standpoint. So my example here is Allegan City Dam. This is a city of Allegan. It's a waterfront community. The river runs right through. It's been impounded for some time, and because of that, you have a backwater, a slower moving water against the river itself with waterfront features, a kayak launch, and uh, boardwalks built there. They're concerned about changing that, even though this dam is aging and they need to do something about it. So we oftentimes do artist renderings to try to describe what it might look like. In this particular case, you can see they're gaining a lot of green space and a lot of green area. I'm gonna move upstream and show from the different angle how much wetland habitat and boardwalks and how the riverfront still can maintain a riverfront quality with recreational values um, and look pretty attractive at the same time. So some, a lot of it is dealing with social kind of response to concerns with what a dam removal might look like. And then finally, the, I talked a lot about sediments behind the dam, but 
With those sediments oftentimes comes the accumulation of contaminants. And this is an example from the Otsego City Dam, uh, which is a paper dam with legacy uh, contaminants in the system. So that dam, a lot of the contaminants that we see in water adheres to soft sediment. And when that soft sediment is deposited really commonly behind dams, so are the contaminants. And you end up with a, with a polluted lake bottom. When you're removing a dam, there's a lot of concern about releasing those sediments and those contaminants up downstream. So oftentimes we have to look at strategies to manage con both contamination and sediments to try to limit downstream impacts. Oftentimes that means dredging. So digging out the sediments that are upstream when you draw down a river, you dig out a river channel that the river could follow. It reduces how much sediment has to move and takes some of that contamination out. And then you can carve back the banks, shape the river valley and the flood valley the way you want to, and you have a lot more flood capacity than you might have in, in your impoundment initially, which you may have had flooding issues, especially in urban environments. Or you can build a channel offline, dig a completely new channel, design it based on the criteria of what you see upstream and downstream, and kind of match that habitat. Um, and then move the stream into the new channel, abandon the old channel, and then, then bury that legacy sediment, contaminated sediment, and you don't have to deal with it, um, removing it. So that, that's a really commonly used strategy as well. So I've kind of gone through the ecology and the concerns related to dam removals, but I want to provide some examples now of some actual dam removals that happen locally talk about the sequence of how it happens um, and some of the things that came up through the process so that people can understand what a dam removal scenario might look like in their local community. Um, I'm gonna use the Kalamazoo area of concern, which is basically the polluted area downstream of Kalamazoo or in the Kalamazoo and downstream area based on legacy paper contamination. This is PCB that was released as part of the recycling process of paper. It, the EPA has designated the downstream section as an, a Superfund site, which means it needs to be cleaned up. This is, there's fish consumption advisories in place. You shouldn't eat the fish in the river. There's human health concerns related to the contaminants in the river. Um, so because of that, there's been major cleanup actions mandated by the EPA and in those cleanup actions, there's been an awful lot of dam removals do done as part of it. Um, right off the bat, uh, back in the mid 80s, DNR dams, D the DNR took ownership of a number of dams downstream that were old decommissioned hydroelectric dams. So we have about three dams downstream uh, of Kalamazoo in the Plainwell and Otsego area that uh, no longer functioned as hydro dams. So we removed the superstructure on those dams. That basically means they took everything down to the sill plate or the spillway that you kind of see on a dam. So all the structure above it's gone. It no longer functions. You can't put gates up and down and it draws down the water a little bit. But those dams are still there. Um, just as it kind of orients you to the Superfund site, uh, starts downstream, or I'm sorry, upstream near Kalamazoo by the Morrow Dam. Um, basically, Morrow Dam and Portage Creek come, I'm sorry, Kalamazoo River and Portage Creek come together in the Superfund site, and it's designated polluted all the way down to Lake Michigan. Um, along that course, there's a series of dams, starting with Plainwell Number no. 2 Dam, Plainwell Dam in the city of Plainwell, which, which was recently removed, Otsego City Dam, right in downtown Otsego, Otsego Township Dam, Trowbridge Dam, the City of Allegan Dam, and then the big dam, the furthest downstream is Calkins Dam or Lake Allegan Dam, which is the furthest downstream barrier to Lake Michigan. And, and most people are familiar with that because that's the upstream extent of the salmon and steelhead migrations. Um, just to walk through the history there uh, of some of the things I just mentioned. So Kalamazoo, I'm sorry, the Plainwell City Dam was removed in 2010 as part of the 2010 Plainwell area cleanup. Um, the Portage Creek was excavated and restored as part of the cleanup in 2011. And as part of that, the Alcott Dam was removed, the Alcott Street Dam. Um, and that channel there was built offline and restored in the fashion I kind of talked about before. Um, 2018 also marked the removal of the Otsego Township Dam. Uh, that was part of a $46 million project to, do, to remediate contamination in that area and remove the dam and restore the river. 
Currently, we're planning removal for the Trowbridge Dam, which we're hoping the construction will begin in 2021, 2022. And there's a lot of conversation around Plainwell, too, which is the diversion dams that split the Kalamazoo River around the island city of Plainwell. So the, the example I'm gonna run through is the Otsego Township Dam. This is the one that's been complete recently. We've got a lot of good documentation of the process here. Um, this was a DNR owned dam, the DNR Wildlife Division owns it. Mark Mills from Wildlife spearheaded a lot of the work on this, but it was removed as part of the EPA Superfund project site. Um, this is an image of Otsego Township Dam with the superstructure removed. Like I said, a lot of the things that you think of when you think of a dam aren't there, but the sill's there, the gradient's there, and the impact of the dam is still there. This is an overhead view of what it used to look like. You can see the earthen dam across and then the concrete spillway with the, with the superstructure removed on the southwest side. Um, first step we did was remove, we, we, the, the, the earthen embankment began to fail and there was huge voids in, in, in the dam there. We knew it was going to be a, a imminent failure if something wasn't done. So we put in a temporary water control structure. This allowed us to breach the dam, put something in that was strong, made a sheet pile, and also allowed us to, to manipulate the water level. Um, here's an image of that dam from the downstream side. There's boards across the top of that dam, so we can put them in to raise the water or bring them down, and that would facilitate a drawdown when it comes to doing a removal. Um, here's uh, an example of one of the early stage drawdowns. You can see that the concrete dam is now exposed. It's, it's out of the water, and that's because we've drawn the water level down a little bit. Another kind of cool thing from this image is you could see the, the dredging barges out front of the dam, removing sediment from that, building the stream channel uh, that will eventually be populated by the river when it goes, when it goes free flowing. Um, so that's kind of a step, especially when it comes to removing sediment. If you can do slow drawdowns, remove sediment as you go, it really allows you to control that downstream movement of sediment. And in this case, it allowed you to remove contaminated sediment that was present in this spot. And as they drew down, the upstream sediments became more and more exposed. So this is upstream right by M89 Bridge, down, uh, right above Tro, uh, Otsego Township Dam. And you can see that they're, they're dredging out the channel, they're putting in stability, bank stability structures, kind of building the upstream area. Um, and so, so that's kind of how we stage it. As you draw down, you can do work upstream and work your way downstream. Then you get to removing the, the, the structures that are in place. Once you've got enough of that sediment and a pilot channel dredged, you can, you can start working on taking out the dam piece by piece, either bringing it, drawing it, drawing it down through time or actually doing a removal. And this is early stage construction on the Tro, uh, Otsego Township Dam. Um, this is what it looked like from above. You can see they've already removed the main sheet piles, temporary dam structure we put in place, and they're dewatering and demo, demoing the old concrete dam as, the, as they're going through the process. Um, here's another image of kind of mid-channel opening. The, they open the, the, the north side of the channel and they're getting to the south side. So that you kind of stage projects so that you can work your way through without releasing sediment and, and to just the feasibility of getting into the water and doing some of the work. Um, and then this is the uh, final project. You can see the old concrete dam's gone. It was demoed. It was brought down to a, to a low level flood event so that it still floods over. It provides some wetland habitat and some backwater habitat behind, behind the old plunge pool. But the main river is flowing through the, where the dam used to be. And in, in its place is a riffle. And, and this riffle has become pretty popular for people to, to kayak through because it's one of the higher gradient spots. There's a riffle upstream that we exposed as part of the drawdown. And then there's a riffle here that people can go through. And so um, it's a low gradient, or I'm sorry, it's a high gradient now. It, you know, it's no longer a flat still water blocked by a dam. So you have faster moving water. You don't have that warmed up water, and, uh, and, and it's navigable for both people and fish. Um, part of exposing the new banks is restoring them. So you can see here some of the common techniques, and this is also uh, what was employed at the Otsego Township Dam. We use, we use 
a natural fi coconut fiber blankets that, that's biodegradable but helps control the, the exposed sediment. We use willow plantings because they do a really good job of growing fast roots and, and kind of solidifying up some of that loose sediment. Um, and we bury a lot of what we call tow woods. These are trees that are actually, this area was excavated out. The trees were placed down at bankful height, so, and they provide a really good rough barrier to erosion. And so it's on the outside bend, the water comes into there, it provides really good habitat, it forces the erosion down, you get deep pools instead of losing your bank. And uh, so that's kind of some of the strategies we use in the upstream area. Um, and this is the final result. You, you've got vegetation moving in, a little bit of rock kind of helping shore up some of the sidelines, although this part of the Kalamazoo River is quite rocky. Um, um, and this is the riffle right, down, right where the dam used to be. Um, and so a lot of people worry about what is, what is my exposed lake bottom going to look like once the dams are moved. And, and I earlier showed Morrow Dam in a drawdown state this spring with the mud flats. Uh, here's the same image from today. Uh, this is all vegetation that came in this year. It, it's, it's, it's native vegetation to it. And in, in drawdowns, we do, a, we do an extensive effort to make sure that we're planting native vegetation and we're treating for invasive vegetation that might come into these new successional type environments. But uh, Morrow Dam happened to come in pretty native. So we're looking at willows, we're looking at uh, bulrush, we're looking at uh, all kinds of different native species that have come in. And, re, re, I mean this, and this is just within, within a year of drawdown. So you can see you're, you're not going to see an ugly mud flat barren for long. Here's another example looking down the lake at the dam. You can see the difference there and how, it, how the, aesthetically it improved relatively quickly. And the result of all this effort is a restored stream function. You've got good connectivity for fish. You've got restored slope. You're no longer looking at a slow moving water through a stair step of a dam. Sediment transport's restored. It can move through that system fine. You're gonna reduce downstream erosion as a result. And you end up with faster, cooler, and cleaner water. Um, like I mentioned, it removes the future costs. So there's no more future costs with maintaining this or the Otsego Township Dam. And it takes away any liability of future failures. So. There's a lot of benefits to dam removal, when, especially when a dam's not serving a real viable purpose. Just a few other projects to highlight right now. Um, I mentioned a couple times the Pucker Street Dam on the Dwajek River near Niles. Uh, this is a huge river or a huge dam project that's been in the process of being removed for decades, and it's currently being demolished and taken out right as we speak. It's owned by the city of Niles. It, it hasn't produced power since the 1990s. It's just a legacy concrete structure with potential failure. Um, so by taking this dam out, we're gonna open up 28 miles of the main stem of the Dwajek and an additional 131 miles of tributaries. And those will be accessible from the Great Lakes for salmon, steelhead run. They'll be able to spawn in, in all of these tributaries and contribute to the Lake Michigan fishery. Currently, there's only about three miles of the Dwajek River that's available to them. And that lower three miles of the Dwajek River is a, is a hugely fished fishery and a really important one. So we're, we're hoping that this will open up not just natural reproduction, but a whole host of, of waters for anglers to explore. Uh, here's, an here's a picture of what it looks like as of mid-August. The dam is gone, the, the, the superstructure is gone, the, the, the pump house is gone. Most of the sill has been removed and we're slowly drawing it down as we do construction upstream. But you can see upstream, we're looking at a, a river channel. We're no longer looking at an impoundment. DNR is very highly involved in dam removals. Um, we try to help out with any kind of municipality or any other group that's looking at trying to remove a dam. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of grants and that partners us with a lot of different areas people. So th these are just some examples. We're working with Hillsdale Mill Pond Dam on the upper St. Joe River. Parkville Dam is one that DNR is trying to remove with the help of uh, the St. Joseph uh, Conservation District. Portage Creek in Kalamazoo, we've already had the Alcott Dam removed as part of the uh, remediation work on the area of concern, but Milham Park Dam construction should start this winter. And so that, that, that section there will be restored. And we've been looking at a smaller dam with the city of Portage called the Elijah Root Dam um, on the Portage River. So, so there's a lot of 
A lot of dam removals happening here, right in the middle of the city of Kalamazoo. We've also had conversations with the city of Albion. There's a lot of dam removal work in Grand Rapids, and Allegan City Dam is one that we're hoping to get taken out as part of the remediation process. So there's constantly conversations happening that revolve around dams, both maintaining them and removing them um, when possible, and uh, we're always open to having those conversations. And this is just Southwest Michigan where I happen to work and where we're, we're, we're located, but there's dam removals happening statewide, and bo the Boardman River is one that's been a real big, high-profile one that people have been talking about. And like I said, we're, we're constantly interested in working on dams, having conversations about how to maintain dams. So here's my contact information. Anybody has a dam in their neighborhood or in their, in their city that they're interested in learning more about potential options for. So with that, say thank you.